Hi, I'm Marianne Clements, initiator of the Healing Solidarity Conference, which is what you're listening to and watching right now. Um, I'm a writer and consultant and facilitator of the Replenishment Room. And in this conversation, you're going to hear me talking with Gemma Holdy. Gemma is currently based at the University of Sussex, where she's completing a PhD, which is about aid workers and stress and well-being. And in this conversation, you'll hear her sharing some of the findings of her research and also um, the, talking about the ways in which they call into question our conceptualization of the heroic white Western aid worker. I think this is a really interesting conversation that will have you thinking about some of your assumptions perhaps and I certainly felt inspired after I listened to really think through some of the things I think and talk about. So I hope you'll enjoy this conversation as much as I did. So hi and welcome back to the Healing Solidarity Conference. And I'm here with Gemma today. Um, and I should I'm gonna I'm gonna attempt to say her second name right. So it's Holdy, Gemma Holdy. Right. I got it wrong before, so <laughs> Gemma Holdy. And so Gemma has worked in the aid sector for 15 years, um, mainly on humanitarian human rights and development programs in East Africa and Palestine. She's currently in the final year of her PhD in development studies at Sussex University in the UK. And she's investigating how identities shape the way aid workers approach and manage stress. She spent a year in Kenya doing field research, talking to Kenyan and expatriate aid workers about their experiences. She also ran a stress management workshop there and uses her research and her personal self-care practice to support aid worker wellbeing. She's written about her research on her blog site, Life in Crisis, which is www.gemmaholdy.com, and for the online academic magazine, The Conversation. And she tweets using the handle Aid Soul Search. So hi, Gemma, and welcome to the conference. Hello, it's a pleasure <laughs> to be here. Thanks for inviting me. You're welcome, and thanks for taking the time to join us. So I just wanted to start by asking you just to tell us a bit more about your research um, and some of, something of what you are, you are learning or you learned from it. Sure. So um, I conducted my research in Kenya, as you just um, said in the introduction, um, and I was there for about a year. Yeah. Um, and mainly in Nairobi and in northern Kenya in Turkana uh, district district or county as it's called um, and I was talking to um, Kenyan and um, European American other African aid workers um, it was a very sort of qualitative research so it, a lot of the time it was it was conversations around the challenges that that people experience in the work that they do and it was in a number of different types of kind of environments and settings so in Nairobi obviously a lot of the people working there are, are working kind of from their office mm -hmm. in Nairobi um, possibly traveling out to other parts of the country or, or to neighboring countries and um, particularly Somalia I've, I've talked to quite a lot of people who worked in Somalia mm -hmm. um, and then in northern Kenya um, it was much more of a sort of uh, humanitarian setting um, particularly um, Kakuma which was um, a refugee camp in Turkana um, kind of near the border with South Sudan um, and I stayed there for a, for a while in what was the sort of typical uh, humanitarian compound setting mm -hmm. um, in in these sort of quite fortified areas um, near the refugee camp where, where aid workers do a lot of their work from mm -hmm. um, so so that was that was essentially the research that I did um, and I guess my interest really with that has been the, the, the key research question was sort of looking at um, how identities shape the way aid workers um, understand and, and experience stress. Mm -hmm. um, but within that, I'm particularly interested in um, looking at um, obviously the differences um, around if you're a national staff or an international mm -hmm. staff. Yeah. Um, and also the, the sort of intersectionality of um, gender and race um, and other elements as well, um, looking at people's religion and how that impacts on their um, 
kind of worldview and how they approach what they do. Mm -hmm. um, and I guess tied to that, I was very interested in looking at um, what motivates aid workers. Why do they do the work they do? Um, how does that change over time? Um, and how are their motivations kind of judged or assessed within a sector that's all supposedly about kind of heroism and selflessness and, and going out to these sort of supposedly dangerous places. Mm -hmm. um, so yeah, and, and also looking, I guess, at the, the socioeconomic and structural conditions so yeah, I, I guess um, yeah, structures that structures of aid and um, socio-economic and cultural conditions are all things that kind of feed into um, people's experiences within the aid sector and what they find stressful mm -hmm. and how they deal with that stress. Yeah, yeah, okay, and 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 so I'm interested to know a little bit about what you what kind of observations came out of that research obviously it, you know it's maybe not one learning <laughs> from such a thorough look at the issues yes. but um what kinds of things did you learn about the different ways people deal with stress the, the mm -hmm. context that aid workers are living with and in um yeah what, yeah yeah, I mean, it's um, there's many different answers, I guess, mm -hmm. that I could give yeah. at the moment as I'm still sort of trying to pull together all the all the findings. Yeah. Um, uh, first of all, I'd I'd just say in terms of what stress actually means, I found this quite interesting because, um, you know how how it's conceptualised and 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 how that term words such as stress or burnout or trauma or even you mm. how those terms are used yeah really varies according to who you're talking to mm -hmm. um and i think a lot of that's to do with the fact that um certainly conditions such as post-traumatic stress disorder or or, or burnout they're, they're highly pathologized terms that mm. are quite um common in um i guess the western world in sort of european countries so i, I often found that a lot of my it, it was my european informants that, that would talk a lot using those kinds of words and it was yeah. often then that were seeking professional help where they were given a, a diagnosis and then and then getting some kind of support to address mm -hmm. that diagnosis um that doesn't mean to say that it didn't it, those things don't exist in other situations but what mm -hmm. i found with um for instance the kenyan aid workers I spoke to and the Somali aid workers I spoke to um, was that the, there was a sort of um, they kind of put stress within this this um, that they had drew different meanings from it in terms of it being more a kind of everyday aspect of their lives mm -hmm. um, that they were having to deal with as part of their life all the time particularly in Somalia mm -hmm. um, so the way that um, people interpret it and respond to it is different as a result you know the the um, medical services aren't always available and those terms aren't always used you know it's certainly burnout the term burnout is less of a familiar term in yeah. a lot of African contexts than it is among kind of western aid workers who are using this word all the time yeah. um, so, so I have an interest in that and just sort of um, trying to highlight that um, you know how how stress is understood um, and responded to kind of feeds into what we mean by well-being mm -hmm. um, and that, that we ought to really acknowledge those differences because um, when it comes to uh, staff care mechanisms for instance in in the aid organization mm -hmm. there can't really be a one-size-fits-all approach and and certainly just having a counseling service doesn't necessarily cut it because not everyone wants counselling anyway that's not necessarily the answer um so so that was kind of one element but i guess tied to that is that um you know there are structural conditions um mm -hmm. related to the way aid work is done that um are going to affect people's well-being mm -hmm. and those those have to be recognized as well so Although, you know, there's often the assumption that um, stress uh, or, or trauma is, is linked to um, a critical incident, um, mm -hmm. you know, working in a dangerous, uh, insecure area. And, and I'm certainly not denying that that 
is the case in many situations. Um, but what I was also investigating is that a lot of the stress actually that people talked about, or at least the challenges of the work that they talked about, were more related to um, the kind of everyday policies and practices and mm -hmm. working culture um, of, of their organizations. Um, and so, so I, I kind of, I looked at that through different um, perspectives. For instance, aid workers working in Kakuma refugee camp, um, which was a very fortified, uh, securitized area where people, where aid workers couldn't bring their partners or their families. So they could only see them during their rest and recuperation period every eight to 10 weeks. Mm -hmm. um, they sort of were very shut off from the refugee community in terms of the kind of movement restrictions and how they could engage with the refugee community there. These are all kind of elements in that particular situation that were challenging and and in some ways unreal it, mm -hmm. it kind of take took uh, aid workers away from what might be normal everyday forms of social interaction mm -hmm. and created certain restrictions around who they can talk to uh, where they can get support from you know their normal family unit isn't there um, so I think I think those sorts of things are important to understand as as challenging aspects of of, of aid work that, that can be very stressful and difficult for people um, and then I guess another element that I'm looking at is this idea of um, the perfect humanitarian this idea that you know to be a really good humanitarian you have to be a certain person mm -hmm. um, and, and that certain person is, is the kind of it's the one that's put out in all the awareness raising materials of um, NGOs and charities when you kind of see what is often a uh, white Western aid worker who's who's flying from one emergency to another mm -hmm. is so committed um, doesn't have any family ties because they're just there throwing themselves into their work um, and what they do is is supposedly you know having a wonderful impact on people and ending suffering and i'm trying to really unpick that and see that you know there are real ambiguities around what we do as aid workers mm -hmm. um, that causes a lot of self-doubt um, but also causes many people to really fight to work very hard to try and live up to that rather flawed uh, uh, inaccurate image Mm -hmm. And again, this this is um, a source of of um, mental angst um, and and discomfort for people. So so that's another element that really sort of go cuts through everything that I've been looking at. Mm, interesting. Where did, in your sense of it, as you sort of explore the material you gathered, this idea of the sort of perfect humanitarian. Do you trace it to anywhere or anything in particular, or is it something that we've kind of co-created, <laughs> do you think? Um, I think it's a, a bit of both. I mean, I, I do think it's been put out there by our organisations. Um, I think it's part of the fundraising drive yeah. is to, to put forward a certain image. Mm -hmm. um, and it goes through even in terms of organizational strategies, goals and objectives, how we report to donors, um, mm -hmm. you know, all of it's, it's supposedly with very sort of tangible, um, clear cut goals and objectives and outputs and when yeah. the reality is, is very, very different. And so yeah. people really, really struggle with that because, you know, first of all, it's very hard to achieve what is being set out on paper and in yeah. the sort of the public image. Um, and secondly, you know, you may actually be feeling that you're, you're not achieving anything at all and doing more harm than good. Um, but I, I think the humanitarian setting is particularly interesting as well, because I think there's definitely, uh, a, definitely a certain narrative associated with working in disaster areas and that narrative is much a, a lot to do with danger mm -hmm. and risk um and sort of othering of of the affected communities so that they become mere 
aid recipients um, uh, and not really human beings anymore. Um, and that really sort of is perpetuated through these structures in terms of people living in these compounds mm -hmm. um, and you know sort of the, all the movement restrictions and, and um, policies around how they should behave and how they should interact with people plus the fact that generally a lot of humanitarian workers will go from one emergency deployment to another yeah. And so, so an image that's often associated with that is this sort of cowboy image or Wild West image, you know, someone who's got no ties, who's really independent, usually heavy smoker and drinker and mm -hmm. is mm -hmm. going around the place, you know, saving the world. Um, mm -hmm. and, and unfortunately, it sort of does seep through in, in, in the behaviour of aid workers in those settings. Yeah. Um, so I think that's a particular, uh, you know, a, a particular dynamic there that sort of needs to be unpicked a little bit and unravelled. Mm, interesting. Um, yeah, no, it, <laughs> I like the cowboy image. I was thinking about Superman yeah. when you said that. <laughs> I don't know what Superman, yeah, I guess Superman's slightly different, but it, 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 I have this idea of like, yeah, they're coming to save the day. Yeah. Um, let's talk about what it's really like. What, what is it really like if it's, you know, so people might be, you know, to, to some extent trying to live into this archetype and I, and yeah. I get that, you know, and I think it exists also in development settings, but it's, it's perhaps different because there's less of this sort of restrictive mm. living context and there's a bit, usually a bit more long term, you know, so, so say somebody is move somewhere for a development intervention is like to be longer term and stuff so i think it is probably diluted a bit but i do think it's there as well you know yeah. That, yeah. um but, yeah. but so what's it really like you know in the in the in your research and experience well i think it does go back to um motivations which mm -hmm. which i i was very interested in looking at and i certainly yeah. discussed that with a lot of my informants you know what why were they doing the work they were doing and how that changed over time and you know I, I think um, again you know that the assumption is um, and I know aid workers will, will challenge this themselves so I'm not really saying it's it's their assumption but it's more in the sort of public image yeah um, is that that people are going into it because they're really altruistic and selfless and they want to save people and mm -hmm. you know um and of course that that is there in many respects but i do think it's important to look at who it is that we're, we're sort of talking about um you know a, an aid worker who's come from a fairly wealthy privileged background in a european country and you know there are many that are from that background and i i count myself within that yeah. Um, you know, they're, they're going to have different motivations going to a um, poor African country or, or a place where there's war um, uh, and great suffering. Um, their motivations may well be very different. Um, and talking, for instance, to the, the Kenyans I spoke to, um, you know, for, for them, of course, they, they had a lot of commitment to what they were doing because, you know, this is their country. You know, they're in, a lot of the time they're, they're contributing to um, making their own country a better place to be for, for themselves and for their children um, mm -hmm. and for their communities. Um, but there's no denying that for a lot of them, um, they were really needing job security Mm -hmm. um uh, in a country where you know there's high un unemployment um people struggle to get work and so if you have a job you really want to stick with it um and um it's not just the fact that there's high unemployment it's also the fact that many kenyans have extended family responsibilities in a way that didn't necessarily apply with a lot of the European or American aid workers I spoke to. Yeah. Of course, people may um, have a husband or wife with them, but in the case of Kenyans, often it was that they were, you know, supporting their niece or, you know, providing um, school fees for their, for their cousins or nieces or nephews. 
um, as well as um, supporting their brothers and sisters and children. Um, so, so those sorts of um, that, those sorts of factors are important to acknowledge, and yet they're not really within the sector, mm -hmm. because the idea is that you know you come into the work and you are fully committed and you're doing it because of um, the value attached to helping others which um, as I say I think that that's certainly there for a lot of people that are doing this work but you know that people do have private lives and they have personal lives and needs and desires and things that um, they are concerned about in terms of supporting their own families that often gets written out of um, sort of the aid work narrative mm -hmm. and, and mm -hmm. what aid work is about and I think that actually is a quite a big source of stress for people particularly for Kenyans in um, situations where they you know they are looking after extended family and they may only be on one-year contracts with mm -hmm. their NGOs which is fairly common particularly for national staff mm -hmm. um, and you know once that one year contract's over then what happens next for them they're not necessarily going to jump onto the next country in the next disaster setting um, because that is not um, the way that they are working yeah. unlike the international staff who often do have those sort of opportunities to deploy to a different situation mm -hmm. um so i think those realities are sort of they're either written out of of the way aid work is done or they're, they're judged a little bit so you know that i did often hear this kind of very um cold dichotomy of oh you know the kenyans they're just in it for the money whereas you know that the, the European expats they're the ones that are really committed and I sort of heard that mm -hmm. um, being thrown about quite a bit whilst I was in Kenya and I just I don't think that's a fair or accurate way of looking at it and instead we ought to actually be seeing that you know just the, the way that someone like me comes into this work may be very very different from um, someone from the global south and we shouldn't be judging people on that. Mm -hmm. I wonder, um, it occurred to me while you were talking, did you look at pay as a factor as well in terms of stress and well-being and, mm -hmm. and, and sort of people's motivation? Because I think, yeah, that would occur to me as also being maybe slightly ignored but very pertinent, you know, sometimes yeah. in, in these sort of conversations. Absolutely. And I think, um, again, Kenyans talked about that a lot, feeling that uh, they were not being adequately compensated compared with some of their expat yeah. colleagues. Yeah. Um, and certainly there were differences. I mean, I didn't ask people a lot about their salaries. It's not an easy question to no. ask. It can be a, a bit intrusive. But, but people certainly discuss the fact that, that what they received and the way that they lived was very different from their their expat counterparts so just mm -hmm. as an example i mean i can think of two examples so for instance in in kakuma um refugee camp um you know national staff um often um were not able to get the, the sort of chartered planes that would fly you out of kakuma for your rest and recuperation um those planes uh it was not all the time but a lot of the time it was only the international staff that could get those planes so it would mean that the national staff would have to um, find other means or pay for the flight themselves and they were traveling long distances to get to their families you know they weren't necessarily just going to Nairobi which is what the majority of the international staff were doing mm. um, sometimes they were having to go to a completely different part of the country to, to get to their families and that would sometimes take up half of their rest and recuperation period right. just traveling to get there yeah. um, so there were those sorts of differences there um, and then in Nairobi what was quite striking was the fact that a lot of the expat staff lived in you know very comfortable uh, furnished apartments or houses pretty close to their offices mm -hmm. um, so they could get to their office fairly easily and it was also in these sort of quite popular wealthy suburbs where there's nice bars and restaurants um a lot of the kenyan staff were living on the other side of town 
because yeah. that's what they could afford, particularly if they wanted a large enough house to, to accommodate their family. Yeah. Um, and it meant that they would spend sometimes two hours or more getting to work each day, either on public transport or by car, but either way in these huge traffic jams that Nairobi's notorious for. Yeah. Um, mm -hmm. So, and, and things like that just don't sort of really get acknowledged. Um, yeah. And a lot of this is to do with not necessarily different salaries sometimes the salary may be the same and i know that there is more effort particularly in kenya to sort of bring in a, a single salary system in a lot of organizations but the fact is that international staff will still receive extra benefits mm -hmm. around that and allowances uh which which the national staff don't receive yeah so they get the flights and the accommodation and things would be additional benefits even if the salary was the same yeah it, it, it makes me wonder sort of talking about this and then relating it back to this, I, this, you know, as we talked about flawed idea of the good, was it the perfect humanitarian? Yes. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> it yeah. lands very differently when we're in this conversation of sort of difference between staff, even working in the same agency, the different experiences they might have and the ways that they're treated by organizations and, and stuff, doesn't it? Yeah. Um, and it, so in terms of well being. Because mm -hmm. um, in one of the conversations I've had already with um, Fred Oyuko, who, you know, you didn't hear that conversation yet, but um, <laughs> he's Kenyan and working in, mm -hmm. in development. And mm -hmm. um, he talked about, uh, specifically about the, um, how, you know, sometimes ex expats will come to Kenya and maybe do some work with an organisation and then they get to go on holiday somewhere and take their time out and have a break and and the fact that you know it's, all, it's been very difficult for him to afford that kind of thing because of you know the sal salary differentiation mm. between him and somebody coming in from outside and I think in terms of well-being that that was a really interesting observation for me that actually you know financial capital may be able to buy us certain aspects of well-being and we could break down well-being in different ways, I guess, mm -hmm. like holidays, for example. Yes. Mm -hmm. And recuperation is, I guess, they're talking about the same thing. Did you find that, um, like, Kenyan staff had different concerns about well-being or did they have the same ones but less access to sort of services mm -hmm. and things? Like, what did you find about that in your research? Yeah, that is that's an interesting point, that particularly in Kenya, actually, because... Mm -hmm there's been quite a sort of explosion of um, well-being services in Kenya in the last few years in mm -hmm. terms of yoga classes yeah. and um, uh, therapy services, massage mm -hmm. services, life coaches. I mean, there's, you know, it's become a real industry almost there. Yeah. Um, and so I was very aware when I was, when I was in Kenya that, that people were seeking out that, that form of support, but it was, primarily the Europeans that I met there that were doing that um, and you know some of them had got serious uh, illnesses as a result of their work you know the, the, there were some that had uh, were suffering a burnout that um, that had been signed off work from by their doctors yeah um, so so you know their their needs were genuine there in terms of, of, of looking for sort of some kind of professional support mm -hmm. um but yes i mean these things do cost money and uh um even in you know in a country like kenya the, the costs of that sort of service is is pretty high mm -hmm. um so yeah i didn't i didn't um meet so many kenyans that were looking for that kind of help mm -hmm. um but then there are other differences, you know, I think, you know, Kenyans um, do have their families around them. They've got the family support unit um, and they've got their communities around them, too. And I think, um, you know, that is quite a big distinction there. The fact mm -hmm. that um, aid workers, international aid workers are coming in and they don't don't have that support around them. Mm -hmm. um, but at the same time, I think, again, it is to do with you know, the, the sort of lifestyles, living conditions, what benefits you get from your job and the fact yeah. that, um, you know, a lot of the international aid workers on higher, higher salaries, 
don't have huge family responsibilities so they can spend a bit of extra money mm -hmm. on going to counseling um whereas that's just not an option as as you were talk, uh, saying about the person the kenyan that you mm -hmm. spoke to you know it's it, it's that sometimes just those things are not an option for them because they've got so many other things that they need to put money into so yeah. i think um yeah there are there are differences there yeah yeah I want to sort of um, step our lens out a little bit because I know both you and I have thought quite a lot about it sort of in the wake of the um, sexual abuse um, stories mm -hmm. around about Oxfam Save the Children and, and other um, international organisations. Mm -hmm. We've both been thinking a bit about, quite a bit about um, how well-being and, and also these ideas of kind of the perfect age worker and stuff, like how all these pieces might um, fit together and what we might be able to say to the sector more widely about those things. And I know like part of my thinking has been around um, that actually we have to look at ourselves and it's not just our well-being, but also the ways in which we might be manifesting um, uh, these kind of architects of trying to be the perfect mm -hmm. person and, and, do, and in doing so, ignoring the ways in which we, we might actually be. Um, participating in practices that are, that are inequitable and unfair and stuff um, and I just wonder like from your perspective and your research and where you are right now thinking about it what kinds of thoughts do you have about the sector more widely and what might need to shift and change? Um, I mean I think I think we need to look at it from two angles and, and one is looking at the structural conditions that mm -hmm. contribute to stress so it's some of the things that i've touched upon in terms of the policies and practices and the sort of working culture mm -hmm. um, of, of aid and the fact that it's it's very difficult for people to bring in bring their private lives into the workplace um, mm -hmm. and there's often very little sympathy around mm -hmm. personal problems um, so i think i think that's that's certainly a, a big problem which it's it's not an easy there's not an easy answer to i mean i, I think i would say that up front i think this whole uh, scandal around uh sexual abuse within the sector has highlighted that there is a system in in the sector it's it's built on us on an unequal system mm -hmm. uh which which privileges some people yeah. and uh doesn't allow others to um really sort of come forward and and have a say in how yeah. aid work is done yeah. um and how you uh address that is a long-term project right. um i think i think there are sort of policies that perhaps need to change around um particularly around employment and and who who is it that um has the opportunity to get to the top uh mm -hmm. where you know at the moment the sort of senior management of of uh, within the sector it's it still is dominated by white men mm -hmm. um and a lot of white women too but i mean it's it, it i i think either way that needs to be looked at in terms of how to um create more opportunities and and to um make uh organizations more inclusive mm -hmm. um and allow <laughs> allow people from the global south to have more of a say and an input in 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 projects and programs that are affecting their own lives and their own communities um you know it's it's they they are the experts on this and yet they're right. not seen as as such yeah although i know lots of people don't like that word expert anyway it can be analyzed <laughs> separately but um but yeah i think i think that's that's a big project that needs to be looked at and will take a lot of time um, yeah. and a lot of reflection I, I think in the sort of day-to-day -day practices what I'm interested in is 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 how to um, create spaces where those kinds of conversations can actually take place around privilege and around power around unfair treatment um, and those spaces need to be non-hierarchical and they need to be inclusive mm. um, and I think I'd certainly like to use my research and, and my own experiences kind of looking at self-care practices to 
um, create those spaces within organizations. And that's, that's, that's not just looking to create the spaces for staff, but for management as well, yeah. for donors as well. You know, everyone needs to be having these conversations, but in a, a compassionate way around how we can um, challenge these structures or question these structures, mm -hmm. um, whether it's the sort of employment policies that we're questioning, or for instance, it's the structures within the humanitarian compound that, you yeah. know, separates people behind these fortified walls. Um, you know, how to sort of start having conversations where we might be looking at aid and aid work in a different way. Um, so I would also say, sort of secondly, that um, I think it's each of our responsibilities to look at how to change the working culture. So, yes, there are structural conditions that need to change and that, you know, some of that does need to be led by management. Mm -hmm. But we as individuals need to be looking at how we can start walking the talk in how we um, do our work. I think that that's around work like work life balance mm -hmm. um, and and how we really carve out time for ourselves um, but also how we um, reach out to people a bit more not just because we need support but maybe they need support too so that we can encourage a space where people do feel safe to say I'm not coping mm -hmm. um, and that that's okay and that people aren't judged Mm -hmm. on my on that um so i do think there's an individual responsibility there as well to sort of look after ourselves and look after each other and mm -hmm. and uh, to question ourselves too, question our privileges question um you know are we are we allowing space for others in the way that we do the work that we're doing um and yeah to to try to overcome this this perfect humanitarian mm -hmm. in the, in the that we've all got you know um personal issues and problems um and you know that that none of us are perfect in that sense um mm. and just trying to um yeah be, be willing to kind of talk about that openly in the workplace yeah and i, I want to mention that she one of the other conversations as well that i had with ponce Macete because she said something that really chimes with this for me so um she said i didn't i didn't start doing development um work because i i'm good i did it because i'm angry mm. and i think that's a really inter interesting distinction when we ha you know coming into the end of this conversation we've just had because actually if we're here because we're angry at the state of the world, that doesn't necessarily mean that we're perfect, you know? And there's a, that yeah. feels like a very different energy to me and one that I feel so much more comfortable with. Yeah. And I know that over the years I've tried to explain to people outside the sector, you know, this thing about, you know, it's, I, I don't want to be a person who's perfect. I'm not trying to be a person who's perfect and I don't believe in mm. that concept. And it often falls very uncomfortably with them because they're used to this idea of, um, you know, maybe they give a bit of money to charity and then there's, it's almost like the problem goes away and like yeah. something gets done and, and isn't it great that you're doing that and accepting a supposedly lesser salary to do it, right? Mm -hmm. And actually that whole idea that, that people can sort of give to a problem and that there's some perfect people that go solve it with their money and they're, you know, and that, that then the rest of life can go on and we don't have to worry about the inequity in the world is kind of... yeah. That's well, and I think actually, you know, this hot, this I, this feeling of anger. Of course, it drives so many of us. It certainly drove me when I sort of first started working in the sector. But but you know, the reality often is you then get within these organisations, and it's highly professionalised. Mm -hmm. um, you know, there's all these sorts of rules and regulations around what you can and can't do, and what groups you can support and not support, and what the donor wants and all of that and that anger often just sort of gets lost you know yeah. you lose that that passion um and that's definitely another element i'm very very interested in and i think it's very important is is how do people stay passionate with what they do and it's, it's a question i'm asking actually as i i'm writing a thesis chapter on it now kind of what are the elements that that pe that keep people going yeah. um and I do think I do think uh, a, a form of religious or spiritual faith has a role to play for a lot mm -hmm. of people. 
because mm -hmm. it it sort of helps people see that you know it's there's something bigger than this whole structure around them that's telling them they should do this or not do that um, yeah. um and it's also kind of helping people to see what their limitations are and learn from them you know how can we learn from what we can and can't do but still believe in what we're doing yeah. um and maintain that 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 healthy anger mm -hmm. um so yeah and i do think we're up against you know it it can feel like we're up against this huge machine that's not really working in our favor but that goes back to what i was saying before how can we kind of unpick that machine a little bit and change it as well yeah yeah i think that's the work yeah yeah and it's a long project you yeah. know it, it's I think you know what's happening with this um, on the back of the whole uh, sex abuse scandal. You know, there's a lot of discussions around change, you know better policies and um, all sorts of ideas around that. Um, but you know, it, it still comes back to that there's a working culture that has to be changed, and that's going to take time. It's not going to happen overnight. Um, and part of that is you know letting our sort of personal lives come into it a bit and when i say personal lives it includes our passions and our motivations and our mm. hopes and our dreams you know where does that lie within the work that we're doing um and how can we really sort of use that in in a in a positive way and and yeah sort of be, be more of ourselves rather than mm -hmm. trying to be some other sort of flawed image <laughs> the perfect humanitarian <laughs> yeah exactly the perfect humanitarian i don't think they exist so <laughs> i feel like i d just identifying that almost as something you know maybe an archetype of the, but it is actually the first step as well so it's like a, mm -hmm. once we see that we can sort of see it as that thing that, that actually isn't real i think that feels like a first step towards opening up these conversations i think it's really helpful to sort yeah of and and the fact that you know unfortunately that that perfect image is is highly sort of gendered and racialized as well and yeah. what does that say about yeah. power um, and privilege within the sector and how can we how can we overturn that um, and, and tell a different story yeah that's such useful food for thought thank you so much <laughs> Gemma, for speaking with us today thank you thank you it's been great and yeah I, I look forward to taking part in the rest of the conference as well I'm Marianne Clements and you've been listening to me in conversation with Gemma Holdy and this is the Healing Solidarity Conference. If you would like to have more time to listen to this recording and think about some of the suggestions and ideas in it and or any of the other recordings that are part of our Healing Solidarity Conference, then remember that you can make a contribution and get access to the recordings and also to ongoing conversations about Healing Solidarity, um, both personal and group conversations um, are available. Please, um, if you're interested in that, just click the link below this video to find out more. Thank you.